Hello ladies and gentlemen, let's have a short discussion of the fixed effects model using Python code. Um, first, we're going to import some packages and then we're going to set some uh, defaults. So let's just reset everything here and let's clear all the outputs. All right. First, we're going to be setting the number of individuals and number of time periods per individual and then the dispersion on the individual fixed effects ci and the idiosyncratic error terms u here as you can see we'll be using a lot more variance on the c's just for illustration purposes all right then the most crucial function is simulate data it's going to set a vector of beta coefficients that are all just going to be ones then we draw our x variables and it's going to have a constant row first and we're going to stack horizontally next to it a matrix of uh, random normals with zero mean and a standard dispersion of one. That's not really so important. It just matters for the scaling of the axes. And we're going to have n by n times t of them and of course k minus one so that this vector in total will be nt by k. Then we have our idiosyncratic error terms, which are just random normals, and we're going to have our individual fixed effects, which are going to be normals as well, here with 0 and sigma u, and here with 0 and sigma c. But here we only draw n of them, and then we repeat them. And how do we do that? We use this ii vector that I created, which takes element the, the element 0, so the first element, 10 times, or t times, and then it takes element 1, t times, element 2, t times, and so on. So it's repeating elements down and converting from n by 1 to nt by 1. And at this step here, we make sure that this is not just, this will return a, a, a vector of, uh, that has just one dimension, and now we make it two-dimensional, and we ensure that it's a, vec a, a, um, a column vector, so it's standing up. And at this stage here, we induce correlation between the individual fixed effect and the x if that is required. So one of the inputs is coef cx, so the coefficient between c and x. Um, and it's inducing uh, this uh, linear relationship between c and x. It's taking uh, c for all of the rows. So remember that c is now nt by 1 and multiplying with this coefficient and adding it to the first column uh, or to the second column in x, uh, column 1. So not to the constant term, but to uh, the first regressor. <clears throat> and then we create uh, y as x times beta. We use the at sign to use a matrix multiplication plus c plus u. And this is where it's important that uh, we are not just using vectors, but we're using matrices uh, in, in Python's way of thinking so that this is in t by one and not just in t. And then we return all of the simulated data, including the error terms, even though those are not typically uh, observed in a data set. The next function here run, just runs an OLS regression and returns our uh, beta hat coefficients um, and the way that we do that is we take x prime times x, we invert that matrix, and we multiply it by x prime y. So it's our usual formula, x prime x inverse, x prime y. And then there's an extra function that we use for plotting, for adding this regression line to a plot. All right, so let's get started here and see what we have to look at. <clears throat> this is if we're simulating with sigma c equal to 10, sigma u equal to point, uh, 1, and uh, no correlation between uh, c and x. And what you can see is that the lines that are similarly colored, which is that they belong to the same individual, for example, line 0 up here, they're kind of vertically above each other. If we were to instead have no dispersion on our uh, c term, sigma c, then we'd have what is uh, kind of a more usual OLS setting. And if we uh, add a little bit more 
a variation to the idiosyncratic term, this starts to look more like a point cloud. And as you can see, the dots that belong to the same individual are now all over the place. The brightest uh, dots here are both at the uh, top here and at the bottom. So they're kind of all over the place and our OLS regression line just goes through the point cloud. And the more noise we add to this, what simply happens is that uh, we start to, it looks like there's no slope, even though it's just because the, the y-axis is blowing up. So uh, uh, we can help ourselves a little bit by forcing it to use the same limits on the y-axis and reducing um, the dispersion of on sigma u. And then we can see, okay, it has this, it has a similar slope, but there's just this much, it's much more precisely estimated because it's easy to draw a line through these dots, so to speak. All right, but then let's see what happens when we add our dispersion to sigma c. What we can see is that now all of the lines are kind of parallel shifted above each other. If we run it different times, we can see that it kind of shifts who is on top and who is on uh, on the bottom, um, but we have this similar pattern that they're parallel shifts of one another. We can make this even uh, more extreme by uh, increasing the variance on sigma c further, and now they're just completely separated. And as you can see, the, the OLS fit line is actually following the general slope here, but of course it's going to be much less precisely estimated, but that's just pooled OLS, and that's as we we're going to see in the lectures, there, there's no problem with this because we're in a random effects world, there's no correlation between C and X. Now we've set that correlation to zero, and so it's not causing an inogeneity problem, it's just adding noise and making our estimator uh, more noisy, less precise. But let, then let's go back down a little bit here, and let me also add uh, a seed and what that does is that every time I run the cell now I get the same draws of the dispersion terms and so the lines are in the same places and let's see now what happens if we start to add a correlation with X now what happened is if you have um, a low value of C then that gets added to the uh, column one in X, so the, the second column in X, so to the regressor. So now there's a correlation between having a higher C also means that you're gonna have a tendency to have a higher X. And that's what we can see here. So now, we, in each of these cases, the, the, the little family of dots are, the kind of pointing upwards, but there's a general trend that the higher the higher up we are in terms of the uh, the CI, so which scales all of the points upwards, that also has a tendency to move us outwards on the x-axis. And if we were to create a negative correlation, um, we get a more striking pattern. And maybe we should have a slightly lower slope than this. Let's go with 0.3, for example. Here, what we can see is that within each of the little clusters of dots belonging to the, the same individuals, the line is kind of sloping upwards. But uh, as we move across individuals, their value of x in general tends to be much larger. And that is the, um, that's the problem that we have uh, in, um, when we have fixed effects when they're correlated with the x's, that is that it creates a bias in our uh, pool OLS estimate because we are kind of comparing uh, all of the dots down here that tend to have a high value of x uh, to the ones up here that have a high, low value of x, and we can see that they just have much, much, much smaller y's down here than up here, and that's what's causing the regression line to be sloping downwards. And what we want to do in order to fix that is that we want to demean and one way of demeaning is that we can we can take so remember that our uh, our y vector 
is uh, is 60 by 1 here and that's because we have n equals uh, 6 and t equals 10 and what we can do is we can reshape it to be uh, n by t like so and then we can take the mean across the in dimension 1 so dimension 0 is down dimension 1 is across and what that does is that it takes the average over time within uh, an individual and so what we can do is we can we want to so this is the time average for individual one uh, and uh, so we can if we take y of i equals to zero that didn't work um, it's going to be the first uh, t observations <clears throat> These observations. These are the observations that from the first element to the two, but not including the, the element t. So that two, the first t elements, if we can compute the average of those, then that's what's in here in our convenient formula where we reshape it to n t and take the average again across the, um, the the dimension one. If we take y and um, and we just uh, subtract this value 0.77 from all of the elements belonging to individual one then what we're doing is we're subtracting the time average so if we take ii here then we're repeating it many times and now we just want to m make sure that we make this into a correct vector form, what we can see is we have the time average written t times down. So now we can type y and then we subtract this value. So y equals y minus this. That's subtracting the time average. And then we can try to do the same with x. But for x, we just want to do it for column one. So we want to say, and we can use this convenient way of writing it, so we can reshape x. It has dimension k as well. So we want to take um, only the one that pertains to um, the first variable. Or alternatively, what we can do is we can just say this one. We reshape it to n by t, take the mean across the time dimension, repeat it down. And uh, we don't actually need to do this at this stage because when we're slicing it like this, it's already a list. Now we're demeaning both x and y. And now we can see that they're all on these neat little lines. It might be easier actually to see this if we start by not demeaning x. Now we've demeaned y. So we've taken the, the y values, which were originally like so, up here, and we take the mean, so for this first individual up here, the mean looks to be something like 15. If we subtract that, then it goes from just, maybe this is two above to two below or something. And we can see actually that that's a general pattern down here with up to 2.5 and down to maybe minus one or so. So they go between plus minus two around their averages. So when we subtract the time average, that's what we're seeing here. We're about, about minus two below and plus two above are um, the, the, the time average within each of the individuals. But we can still see that we have this issue with the x variables. We haven't demeaned those. So that's what we do in this final step. And now we see that what's, what's actually left here is all of the observations are lying beautifully on a line within, um, on, on, a, on a regression line. And so if we, when we run a regression on this demean data, what we're getting out is the observations are beautifully um, on this positively sloped line in, in stark contrast to what happened in the, in the pooled sample. And essentially what we're doing is we're saying, well, this little cluster of dots appear to be on a positive slope line. This little cluster of dots are on a positively sloped line. And so is this little dots, uh, cluster of dots. And so we're kind of all shifting them all in here towards the origin. We shift them down by subtracting the mean of y, and we shift them across by subtracting the mean of x. 
and it turns out that they they all end up beautifully on top of each other and it just looks like a, a nice little um, regression line with very very low variation and we can see that if we if we lower the variance on sigma c it's not actually doing all that much here or it's actually not doing anything because we're subtracting the sigma, sigma c by taking out the time average but if we were to increase the variance of an, uh, the idiosyncratic term then that's doing exactly the same as in regular pool or less that's moving us between uh, in the one extreme the dots being perfectly on on top of the line and with high variance on you there uh, we're getting this this point cloud and if we were to try to change the coefficient on uh, the correlation between c and x then we can see that that's not doing anything because we're differencing it out completely uh, whereas if we looked in the po pooled sample uh, when we're moving to this extreme here then we we can't even see what's going on within each of the individual lines we can only see the correlation uh, across the lines and um, so we're completely losing the, the within variation and just comparing uh, across individuals and and if we when we remove it completely then we're back in the um, in the random effects world where the dots are just complete parallel shifts up or down all of the dots across individuals and also here we can see that the time demeaning puts us back uh, in a setting where we have all the dots on the line so hopefully that helped uh, build some extra intuition for how the model works.